GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. One, two, three, four. I believe it's a big challenge for our building um, to keep things in perspective and, and to, um, if we're going to get addicted to anything, let's get addicted to the process. And with that, we welcome you to Trust the Podcast, powered by Better Life Than Dead and the Gear Radio Network. This is episode 125. Episode one, two, five, people. How are we doing? Buffalo Bills versus the New England Patriots. As you may know by now, I am Ryan Wolf at Wolf DLTD, my co host, John Samino at IMJC Money. And look at, I'm sick, still recovering from COVID, so I sound awful. John's on his iPad because he's exhausted, but you know what? We're fitting this in for the people. We want to get the podcast out to get ready for the wild card playoffs. But John, before we get there, as always, you can hear us on betterlivethandead.com, gearnetwork.com, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Make sure to hit the subscribe button as well to stay up to date on your latest podcast. John, it's been a minute, man. How you been? Uh, I've been, Ryan. I'm very, very, very busy. And I apologize if my audio doesn't sound as uh, sharp this week. Um, as Ryan alluded to, I'm, I'm talking on a Bluetooth headset via my iPad. So it sounds like I probably sounds like I'm talking on a cell phone. Um, kind of, but, but yeah, kind of, you know, yeah, I'm just, it's it, breaking down the wall as a press recording. It's late at night and I am dog tired. I don't, I don't yeah. typically, I don't typically podcast this late unless it's a Friday or Saturday night. Um, so, uh, during a week day to podcast yeah. like this it's, it's taking me back a little bit it um, is it really to, is to the earlier days but uh but but yeah it's, it's a struggle so uh, i apologize in advance everybody <laughs> yeah i agree too like i said i'm i'm not feeling great um still testing positive for covid which is really cool no um, this is not this is no not a pity, at all not a pity party here but um i, I said to john off air that you know i felt crappy monday I felt worse today. Odds are if we push the podcast and wait till Wednesday, I might feel bad enough that I can't do it. So we'll just try to fit it in as quick as we can. So here we are. We'll, we'll do what we can. And we'll, we, you know, we're not going <clears> to <throat> take a bye week like the Bills are going to have this coming Sunday at one. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Yes, but indeed. The rundown. Buffalo wraps their incredibly emotional week with a 35 to 23 victory over the New England Patriots. They improved to 13 and 3 on the season and lock up the two seed in the AFC. Uh, the NFL determined this week that if Buffalo were to win Sunday and clinch the two seed, a potential Kansas City Buffalo AFC championship game, if it does take place, it will be at a neutral site, which I believe will be announced in the next few days uh, at least. I hope it's Lambeau Field. That's been the rumor. It's either been Lambeau or Heinz Field, but I think Lambeau Field would be a wonderful place for um, that that big of a matchup. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? The the, his, the history. Never mind. The, you know whether the history of the Green Bay Packers, just Lambeau Field in general, and what it and what that cathedral means to pro football. To have a championship game there, that it, you know of any kind, even when it's an NFC championship game there, that's, it's great. But like a championship game mm. at Lambeau field, the frozen tundra. Yeah. Oh man. You're taught that's money right there, man. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it does sound like the NFL wanted to play it in a, or wants to play in a dome, which, of course they do. which would certainly uh, accentuate the offense on both, both sides of the ball, which is might be great for TV watching, but Detroit's replacing their turf because a lot of people got pissed off about their their slit turf. Mm-hmm. Um, understand a lot of teams are replacing their going to be replacing their turf this off season. This is this was a big year for that. Yeah, I know I mean, Jets Giants are doing that. You said the Lions are doing it. I, I can't remember who else was doing it too, but someone else at, was doing it. End of the day, what we've learned in 2022 into 2023, bullying works. <laughs> yeah. To, to, they, a, to an extent, unless you're so, Rex Ryan trying to build a bully, and then that doesn't yeah. really work. But Jesus, don't take me back there. So Detroit <laughs> that was replacing, before we were trusting the podcast, yeah, my friend. D- Detroit is replacing their turf. Indianapolis has a pre-scheduled volleyball tournament at their uh, stadium, and I have not heard much about Atlanta. But I mean, that would be an option. But then again, you have to consider uh, travel and all that stuff. But then again, I, I don't make those decisions. But 
The 13 regular season wins by the Buffalo Bills tie a club record for wins, most wins in a season. They had 13 wins in 1990, 1991, and 2020 as well. Buffalo mm-hmm. extends its current win streak to seven games, the longest since an eight-game win streak from games three to nine in 1990. And it's the longest streak to end a regular season in franchise history. Their previous record was six straight wins to end the regular season in 2020. So the Bills come into the playoffs locked, loaded, and ready to go, which brings us brings us over to our three big things. Brought to mm-hmm. you by PuckLuck.com your one-stop resource for all your NHL sports betting action. Puckluck.com provides win percentages and score projections for each and every National Hockey League game to tilt the ice in your favor. Not sure what to bet or just in a rut? Not to worry. Puckluck also provides expert picks to get the puck bouncing your way. Please note, though, Puckluck.com, no way affiliated with the National Hockey League, its teams, or the NHLPA. Puckluck.com provides data related to gambling. Cannot guarantee the success of any suggested or related wagers. As always, please gamble responsibly. Now, John, Running down the offensive stats like we always do, plot twist, we're not talking about Josh Allen first because someone else decided that they wanted to set some records and take the spotlight off of Josh Allen QB1 for the first time long time. Running well, back, well, Ryan, Naeem, I'm going to have to ask you who that person is. Running back, Naeem Hines, who, holy crap, man. He had one punt return for six yards. That's not why we're talking here. Four kickoff returns. 235 yards and two touchdowns. He opened the game with a 96 yard kickoff return for a touchdown, which electrified Highmark stadium. The doctors that were taking care of DeMar Hamlin said that he was jumping up and down, yelling and screaming so loud that he set off all the alarms in the ICU, which is great to hear. Um, But the first time the bills touched the ball, John, since the, the, the near tragedy on Monday night football, and this is how they respond. It's unbelievable how that works out. You can't you can't script it any better. And you know it was a great story. It was great. To, it was great to see. I, it legitimately broke the internet. Certainly slowed down my you know, text messages coming in um, because all of my Bills fans friends are like, "What? Wow!" You know, like it just was. It was uplifting after everything that the the, the city, let not not just the team, but just the city of Buffalo in general has dealt with, I mean, you talk about standing in front of like the gates of hell and telling them, yeah, okay, we're coming, man. Um, that, that was just a, that was an incredible moment, a credible uh, scene and just to, to, to see the crowd just embrace it and, and, and the looks on the faces, particularly Josh Allen, um, when, if that first touchdown was just, it was an awesome sight to see. And then to your point about reading, um, about Demar and and setting off all alarm all the alarms. That, that it was a really cool story, man. It was a really good feel. It was a really good vibe, Absolutely. and and it was it was awesome to see. But hey, he didn't stop there. He became the eleventh player in NFL history, the first since Leon Washington did it, September twenty sixth, twenty ten, and the first Bills player ever to record two kickoff return touchdowns in the same game or kickoff return to kickoff returns for touchdowns in the same game i always call you the best in the business for the stats ryan uh props for the uh leon washington reference one of my look at i get favorite jets so i get so excited when i get to see the old names i'm like damn john's gonna love this (laughs) and it gets better it gets better it's the second time in franchise history an opening kickoff has been returned for a touchdown terrence mcgee the other player december 5th 2004 at miami also the 200 the 235 return yards set a new fra- a single game franchise record previously held by Charlie Rogers, who did had 221 return yards versus Minnesota on September 15th, 2002. Also, this is the really, really neat history here. Naeem Hines becomes the first player in NHL history to have a NFL. game with. What did I say? NHL. Thank you. I'm watching the Sabres game as we talk here. My brain's kind of fried. <laughs> I appreciate you, John. First player in NFL history to have a game with two punt returns for touchdowns and another game that had two kickoff returns for touchdowns in his career. A pretty, pretty neat thing, if you ask me. I would say so, yes. Josh Allen, quarterback. You already know that. 19 for 30, one passing, 254 yards, three touches, and one interception with nine rushes for 16 yards. Allen's 16 rush yards. Get this, John. His 16 rushing yards. I just hit puberty. You sure at, did. Put him at over 750 yards for the season. 
marking the second consecutive season that Allen has thrown for over 4,000 yards and rushed for over 750 yards, making him the only player in NFL history to accomplish this feat. But again, he's done it twice in back-to-back seasons. Josh Allen also finishes the season with 35 passing touchdowns, which is third most in Bill's single season history. He now owns the top three spots in this single season category. He had 37 in 2020, 36 in 2021, and 35 in 2022. Not he's bad. Playing, he's playing He's playing big boy ball, man. And, you know, it's, it's great to see. And, you, you know, he's, he's really – he's uh, – He's definitely uh, the the glue that holds that team together. If this yeah. whole if this whole uh, Demar Hamlin situation um, has taught us anything, it's it's first of all how val- uh, valuable human life is, and yeah. and secondly, like what a great leader you guys you, the Bills have uh, yeah. in Josh Allen. I mean, between Josh Allen and and Sean McDermott, just the way that they communicated, the way that they were and and just in response to all this and how they handled everything with 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 class with grace um i mean just you guys you guys got a you guys got a real real good one here i would argue a once in once in a generation player i wouldn't i wouldn't disagree with that just i mean obviously for for uh purposes but uh i was looking up the the quote here really quick because there was actually a great quote we're talking about Josh Allen, talking about the Bills, talking about Bills Mafia. Um, excuse me. One of the doctors uh, stated that uh, I'm trying to find it here. The Bills tweet a lot here, man. This is ridiculous. They got so many tweets. Okay. <laughs> so it was one of the doctors mentioning that uh, they found out that Bills Mafia was real this past week. Like just the the outpouring of love and support. It's uh it's been it's been noticed and it's it's been pretty damn fantastic to see it's great to see if you had any doubts that Josh Allen was a, a great leader it's it's clear as day now that he is he is the leader in that locker room um mm-hmm. and stuff like this i mean you never want to you never want to try to you know i don't know it's not like really politicizing but you know kind of making a story of it but you don't want to sit here and say you know that Damar Hamlin almost you know pa- or passing away in the field being brought back to life is like a motivating factor, but it's really allowing the team to rally around themselves and really show how much of a team, a family bond this team has. And we've really seen that this entire week. I mean, the bills did not come out and play great. There's no doubt about it. And we can talk about that a little but later. They didn't need, they really didn't need to at the end of the day. Exactly. Exactly. But here's the thing. We always talk about it. I always tell my say it to my group of friends. I always say, look at the Bills will always adjust. And they mm-hmm. did. They did. We'll talk about that in just a minute. We'll finish up the offense here first, but they were able to adjust and, and get the job done. Um, wide receiver Stefan Diggs, seven catches on 10 targets for 104 yards and a touchdown. He ties the franchise record with his 11th touchdown reception of the season. Bill Brooks, wide receiver, also had 11 touchdown catches in 1995. Diggs' 108 receptions ranked second most in franchise history. He also owns the record for most receptions in franchise history last season. Wide mm. receiver John Brown. Smoke. One Indeed. reception on one target for 42 yards and a touchdown. It was his first touchdown, John, since January 3rd, 2021 against Miami. Versus Miami, I'm sorry. And Brown gave the ball to assistant athletic trainer Denny Callington, who Notably was the one who provided DeMar Hamlin life-saving CPR on Monday night, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, of I mean, course. I don't know how, I don't know how much more you can honor that guy. I mean, he, he deserves, I know he was just doing his job, but like, I mean, man, come on, you know, it's, it's, I, it's I, 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 I'll tell you based on everything, all the information that I've heard from, you know, the different sports shows, different articles that you read that, that were surrounding the subject. Um, it, it's very nice to see, first of all, that the medical professionals uh, of, of the, the training squad of both Buffalo and, quite frankly, Cincinnati, who, who partnered together in, in this uh, whole ordeal um, to, get their, to get their flowers. But what's more is um, just to be able to 
Oh crap! I'm I'm sorry. I lost it. I lost it. <laughs> I, I think, think I know I, where you're going it. with that. Just just being able to. I, I think for me the big thing is being able to see like even though these people were doing their job, even though these people were you know just. I, I guess for lack of better explanation, punch in the clock. Um, they were able in the biggest moment when their number was called to yeah. be able to provide the service that they were, Absolutely. that they were meant to, to, to bring. Yeah. And there was no time that, I mean, I, I know clinically he was dead on the field, but like there was no time, there was no point where his life was in danger because they were able to, to handle it. So, succinctly and so right to, to such perfection that now right. Demar Hamlin is back in Buffalo at Buffalo general looking to potentially um, be, be heading home here sometime soon. Absolutely. I, 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 where I was, where I was going with it, it was on the tip of my tongue. And for some reason, probably because it's late at night, uh, I, I lost it. But what I kept hearing um, repeatedly ad nauseum, and it really holds true is that, you know, unless DeMar, if, if DeMar Hamlin, the, the only place he could have been that would have been better to have that episode happen to him would have been a hospital. Absolutely. That, that's how, that's how like good this, the whole medical squad is there. And, and, and just, you know, they, they, they train as well. They train, you know, they prepare for the worst case scenario because it, you know, the game of football is a, a very tough, violent game that, you know, yeah, you never or, realize, right. You never realize what could happen, what could trigger something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be the biggest hit. It could, it could just be any, it could be anything. And, and just the fact that, you know, they were equipped and ready for the worst case scenario, which was what happened that day. I mean, that was, it's just, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. It's awesome to read. And it's, and it's especially more awesome that, you know, you have the John Browns of the world who's playing the game and, and, and and giving the ball uh, to the, to the trainer there and and recognizing him and, and that whole team for uh, an incredible job well done, life-saving work, like, I mean, it just doesn't, it, 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 when you big picture things, when you look at life in the big, when you view life through the big picture, football is still meaningless um, in it. And it, you know, it's just, it's great to see. It's absolutely something that provides an escape and allows us to mm-hmm. kind of for, for three hours a, a, a day. Um, it, it allows us to kind of set our mind at ease and just not think about what's going on in the outside world. So For sure. when, when that bubble is essentially popped, um, it, it, it seems like, you know, okay, now the game, now we're vulnerable, essentially. Like you never, it, it's something where you don't really think about players being able to get hurt until something actually happens. Mm-hmm. And that was the, clearly the worst case scenario which we right. hope to never see again, but Buffalo has had their moments. I mean, with, with Kevin Everett, now with with Demar Hamlin, mm-hmm. I mean we we've seen some of two of the more mm-hmm. uh, difficult scenes in, in, in you know professional it, football. You know what it reminded me of, almost in a way, and I, and I, I didn't, I didn't not not necessarily to the extent of of you know what happened, but it was a similar situation overall. Do you remember when Jerry the King Lawler um, mm-hmm. had his episode on Monday Night Raw? And yeah, and he was game? snoring on the air. Yeah, it was or he, you know, having that that going into a cardiac arrest himself um, on there and just nearly dying. And the medical team for WWE at that time, did that's the and, and I had that like feeling when I watched it was just like I was like stunned. And, and the details coming out just just blow you away even more that they're right. You know, if I they were that, a second, I, if they were a second longer, it would have been complete or a couple seconds longer. It would have been a completely different story. Right, but they were right. able to to keep their focus and, and and keep their head on straight because again, this is is I mean it's 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 akin to like you being out and a doc someone's like a doctor and able to take care of you like you know say you go down to the airport or something, but mm-hmm. you have to remember like these people are they are their family they are their friends they are their coworkers so it's it right. it makes it all more I mean not that there's again not that there's a, a situation where it's like oh well this is more impressive than that one is, um. But to to be able to keep their composure in a situation like that is, I mean, it's their job. 
but it's also incredibly, incredibly impressive and incredibly um, admirable for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm sorry we, we, we went back and talked about it, but we didn't do it last week out of yep. out of respect for the entire situation. And <laughs> it just it was, you know, it was one of those things, man, where Well and last week too was last week too was time for I mean, obviously it was just me on the podcast because you know, again, things have, have worked out the way that they have with us being so freaking busy this year. Mm-hmm. But last week was a time for celebration and, and just acknowledging the fact that he's he is going to be okay and and that's yeah. you know where we're at right now but it, it was nice um, to see for the for for if but for a week absolutely the world came together and it didn't matter what team you supported what team we were all uh we were all one it, and it, yeah. and you know you've heard the term the phrase football is family ryan that it was proof positive yeah the, the, the past week you know allegiances whatever team allegiances any of that stuff but it, it didn't matter grand scheme of things. And, you know, it really, I, I, I would argue it, it probably opened up a lot of eyes. Yeah. I mean, the outpouring of support was, was overwhelming, but it was absolutely incredible to see the entire, mm. the entire world, not even football, the entire world rally around the Buffalo bills and DeMar Hamlin. It's, it was absolutely incredible to see. Absolutely. Now, wrapping up the offense, tight end Dawson knocks two receptions on two targets for 13 yards and a touchdown. Kind of a quiet day, but he's now scored a touchdown in four consecutive games for the second time in his career, which games two through five in 2021 he did the same thing. Mm-hmm. His 20th career touchdown reception ties Jay Reamers muff for the second most touchdowns by a Bills uh, touchdown receptions by a Bills tight end. The franchise record continues to be Pete Metzelars, who has 25 touchdowns. Have to think. Dawson Knox should eclipse that record next season. Now, wrapping up the defense here. Defensive end Greg Russo, five tackles, one sack, one tackle for a loss, and two quarterback hits. He finishes the season with eight sacks on the year. It's the first time since 2014 that Buffalo has had multiple players tally eight or more sacks on the season. As you may remember, Von Miller finished the year with eight sacks before he tore his ACL linebacker, Tremaine Edmonds, seven tackles, three pass deflections, one interception to one quarterback hit. He has recorded 102 tackles this season. Um, and, and he's recorded a hundred plus tackles in the first, in his first five seasons, each of his first five seasons, I should say he's the first Buffalo bill with a hundred plus tackles in five straight seasons since London Fletcher did it. In 2002 through 2006, another name from the past, London Fletcher, one of one of uh, one of my other favorites too. I, you know, it's it's funny as we name these as we name these names or as you name these names uh, as the season goes on. It's 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 almost as if I've been I've been a Pills fan for longer than I get than, <laughs> than I admit because I know all of these names. I've watched yeah. all of these teams. I've and the excitement the that you get is genuine time. too. It's very genuine. I'm like, it's London Fletcher. I remember him. I remember, like, oh, uh, I remember you know Terrence what, McGee. You know what was one of my favorite ones, too? Do you remember when uh, Takeo Spikes? I was going to say Peerless Price. <laughs> well, yes, Peerless Price was, was absolutely Yeah, Takeo Spikes was, was a good one, too. Yeah, absolutely. He was my favorite. Like I think it was on Madden 04, I think it was, um, where they had like the little video introductions of uh, so the people. And they would like, they, it was like from the Pro Bowl the year before or something, or maybe it was Madden 05, but I remember it was, Tequila Spikes, Buffalo Bills, EN Sports, to the game. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I am, I do not want to cross that dude at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, cornerback Tredavious White, four tackles, one pass deflection, and one interception. This is his first pick since returning from a torn ACL. Uh, his first interception since November 14th, 2021 at the New York Jets. Since entering the league in 2017, White ranks tied for second among all defenders with 19 second half takeaways. Only Justin Simmons has more with 20 second half takeaways. Also, linebacker Matt Milano had a big day, eight tackles, two pass deflections, and an interception as well. Now, deeper into the win, we mentioned the love for uh, Damar Hamlin, the outpouring of love and support. Absolutely incredible. Teams are wearing shirts, players and other teams showing up in Damar Hamlin Bills jerseys, teams painting numbers on the field, and teams having moments of celebration prior to games. Absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic to see. Obviously, though, as one would expect, 
DeMar Hamlin was understandably placed on the IR earlier uh, earlier last week. But the mm-hmm. NFL Network's Ian Rappaport reported that Hamlin's contract contained a standard split, which all contracts or most contracts do, uh, to pay him at a lower rate if he lands on the IR. But sources say Buffalo worked out an agreement with the National Football League and the PA to uh, pay him in full and make sure he gets all the money in his contract because obviously Back. this is a – uh, this is unforeseen. These are unforeseen circumstances. Oh, of course, sure. you you know you you can always say you plan for the be- the the worst case scenario, um, but then when the worst case scenario actually happens, you're like, oh shit, you know it's exactly. Like, it, it it really it saying, really kind of hits you. I believe the saying goes, everyone's got a everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? Precisely. So the one thing I wanted to mention, John, before we take our quick commercial break here in the podcast. The Buffalo Bills struggle out of the gate, which, again, you can't blame them because it's the first time they've taken the field since a traumatic event. So if they you know, if they came out and, and flopped against the Patriots, you'd be like, well, that sucks, but it's understandable. Uh, but at the half, it was 14-14. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, man, this team is, this team is definitely going to have to pick it up in the second half to figure out, you know, if, if, figure out what the hell's going on. And as usual, they responded appropriately. The Bills then outscored the Patriots 21 to 9 in the second half, again to cruise to a 35 to 23 victory. It'll be nice to see, and we'll talk about this in just a moment here. But now that it's the playoffs, it will be nice to see what the Buffalo Bills, what the Buffalo Bills uh will do here. So uh with that being said, I am going to take a quick I'm going to take a quick, we are going to take a quick commercial yeah, break. Say, what, what is this? What is my this? head is full of snot. So I got to take care of that on our commercial <laughs> break. Um, but John will be back with more of uh, trust the podcast right after this quick break here on the gear radio network. One, two, three, four. And we're back here on trust the podcast. John, our look ahead. Looking ahead to injury news, the one thing about the Bills and Patriots game that was absolutely incredible, for the first time in a very long time, the Buffalo Bills injury report didn't have players marked as out. It was unreal, man. It was, I mean, a lot of guys were, you know, this guy was limited or this guy had a vet rest day or whatever, but Mm -hmm. coming into Sunday, they were, they are very healthy. I mean, obviously, considering the guys that are out for the season are out for the season, but yes, yes. Um, in terms of guys, yeah, in terms of guys who can still play, right. very healthy, very healthy. Right. Even more so, cornerback Christian Benford was activated from the IR uh, in the corresponding move with Demar Hamlin headed to the IR. So mm-hmm. more depth in on the on the cornerback ranks, which led to the Buffalo Bills releasing Xavier Rhodes from the practice squad. He subsequently signed with the Dallas Cowboys, and I guess he's going to play. Uh, this weekend in the playoff game, that's what Jerry Jones had alluded to. So uh, that'll well, be interesting. I mean, inevitably, well. when the Cowboys lose, you know, you know whatever. Sorry, Lewis. <laughs> I mean, let's but, be but, honest but here. Death taxes and the Cowboys letting everybody down in the playoffs. It's about yeah. to happen. You're not you wrong. You are not wrong. Hey, it's also not only is it playoff season, it's the silly season, my man. Interview oh, yeah. season has hit. Carolina has reportedly requested to interview Buffalo offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey as part mm. of their search for a new head coach. I feel expect, like Buffalo's going to get raided this offseason. Expect, yeah, expect this stuff to happen more often, obviously. But mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel like, um, excuse me, I feel like, uh, I hate to say it, but if, if, if Leslie Frazier doesn't get an um, doesn't get a job this off season, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Which doesn't really hurt Buffalo. It sucks for Leslie Frazier because he has proven that he's ready for a second chance as a head coach mm-hmm. in the na- in the National Football League. But you know, we don't make the rules up and. I don't. I don't necessarily know that it would. It would be the. It would be completely it for Leslie Frazier. Well, I mean, here's gotta, here's the reason I say that real quick. Sorry to sorry to jump in. The reason I think that is the way that things are going in the National Football League. It seems like teams are now going for offensive coordinators of really good football teams. You've got the offensive coordinator of the Eagles. He's a hot topic. 
Ken Dorsey, who's only been an offensive coordinator for one year, he's getting an interview. Um, other offensive coordinators from other teams are getting interviews. I can't, I don't have it popped up in front of me. I should probably do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it seems like the, the, for the bulk, the, the bulk of it seems to be everybody wants to interview, uh, offensive coordinators aside from, from, uh, what is it aside from Houston, who is rightfully interviewing, uh, the defensive coordinator of the Broncos and, the defensive coordinator of the 49ers, among other people. But again, it seems like the offensive coordinators are the the flavors of the week. They are so absolutely, far. absolutely the flavor of the week. I, I feel like the offensive coordinators, like, you know, because of the game being so focused on the offense and the points and the quarterback and the, you know, all that type of stuff, you know, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what sells tickets offense points that's what equals ratings so yeah in your mind you're thinking well get an offensive get a good offensive coordinator make him a good head coach hmm we'll be able to have you know lots of lights out thing but here's the thing is that when it comes to when it comes to you know coaches at all yeah offensive minded coaches sure could it work yes but you want the best person for the job you that's- want you know you don't need a defensive Sean McDermott He's a defensive-minded guy. Andy Reid, defensive-minded. Bill Belichick, defensive-minded. I'll even I'll even play the Homer hat. Robert Sala, defensive-minded. And and in Sala's case, took took a, a, a Jets team that was 32, 32nd ranked in defense last year, and and made and and put them top five for the majority of the year. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you got to think of Harbaugh, John Harbaugh, defensive mind. Uh, Mike Tomlin, defensive mind. And those are guys, and, and, yep. and I, I feel like, yes, having an offensive mind can get, you know, it, it is a good thing. And especially if it works out very well, but look at Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona. He was the sexy offensive coordinator for a while. And for a while, he was doing pretty good starting yeah. off, but then it just kind of fizzled out. The, the message kind of fizzled out and there wasn't enough variety to get, you know, defense wins championships. That's yeah, so, so this is probably more of a BLTD thing, but we can run down the stuff really quick here. Um, looking, looking at all of the teams, it seems like Vance Joseph in Arizona, their defensive coordinator, has the inside track on that head coaching job. Uh, the Carolina Panthers, they want to talk to they, – they've <laughs> – they're funny because – Jim Harbaugh has been tied to the Panthers, but not because the Panthers have wanted to interview him. It's because he wants to be interviewed by the Panthers. But apparently, <laughs> apparently, um, there are there's some trepidation there because of the you know, hey, Jim Harbaugh had a two hour interview with the Vikings last year, and apparently was somewhat erratic in the interview, and it kind of has turned some teams off. Whatever, uh, mm-hmm. it's Jim Harbaugh. He's a he's an interesting guy either way, right. but. The names you're going to hear, Ben Johnson uh, from the Detroit Lions. The offense blew up this year. You're going to hear Mike Kafka from the Giants. Again, they had another great year offensively. Um, Frank Reich is another one you're obviously going to hear. I think, excuse me, he'll probably end up as an offensive coordinator somewhere. I take him uh, in New York. Shane Steichen, I think is how you say his last name. He's the offensive coordinator of the Eagles. That's another big name. Uh, the Denver Broncos, I did see something about uh, Harbaugh being the potential front runner there early front runner, but they have a great defensive coordinator. I believe his name is easier. Evero is uh, how you say his name. Uh, I, I probably butchered that. I apologize. He's a great up and coming defense, uh, defensive mind. Very smart. Raheem Morris from the Rams. Dan Quinn's also a very big name there. I, I from, from what I've gathered on Twitter, it's, it's either Dan Quinn, Sean Payton, uh, or Jim Harbaugh to get the job there, which you would then hope that they would keep the defensive coordinator on, maybe give him like an assistant head coaching title and then give him a, a, a nice little pay raise or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Looking at the Texans, Jonathan Gannon seems to be the early front runner, the defensive coordinator of the Eagles. Um, I I really think that um, D'Amico Ryans would probably be a good fit there because he's such a smart mind. But mm-hmm. apparently, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. And then in Indianapolis, not a goddamn clue. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. I, I, I'll tell you, I don't like what they did. Um, 
Houston did to uh, to Lovey Smith. I, I think you know uh, hiring him and then firing him after one year after a year after doing that to um, what's his face? I can't remember uh, his name now, but I guess it doesn't I, really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, that's an organization in complete disarray. And then you get and then you got Indianapolis, who you know you they did the thing with Jeff Saturday this this year with pulling him out of the ESPN and putting him on the sidelines. And granted, he beat the Raiders after calling them uh, a terrible team weeks before on, on air, which was her- which was hilarious. But he wasn't ready for a head coaching gig. I so know, hey, I I weird. ultimately think like with with Houston, um, the one thing I've seen a lot of is that Houston hired Lubby Smith with the with the thought process that they were going to fire him after one year, no matter what, because it allowed them to regain legitimacy. Um, but I also, I also don't understand anybody would want to go there because it's like, okay, you're telling me you're going to sell me on a, you know, a dollar in a dream essentially that I'm going to have, uh, some sort of, of job security, despite the fact that you fired so many people lately. So right, that's, that's the hard part as well. But I mean, Indianapolis didn't really do themselves any favors with Jeff Saturday as, as, as interim head coach, because again, it seems like you would think that they would bring a guy like that in because there's no tie to him. So at the end of the year, you can just say, look at, we tried it. It didn't work out, but they seem, they seem confident that they want to at least give him an interview and give him a shot, which. Okay. You know, good luck. God bless America, man. Cause that's a, that's a disaster. Waiting Indeed. Happen. Indeed. Now, looking ahead, John, the moment we've all been waiting for, the AFC wild card, the playoffs are finally here. The Buffalo Bills play host to the, I wish it were colder, Miami Dolphins. It's going to be cold on Sunday, and uh, the Dolphins have lost a ton of games in a row. I hope I didn't just jinx it with the temperatures below 40 degrees. But, hey, Miami, 9-8, and eight, the seventh seed in the AFC. They are a team of extremes, which is kind of strange. They started 3-0, and mm-hmm. lost three straight. Won mm-hmm. five straight, lost five straight, and then won on Sunday to clinch the playoff berth uh, against the Buffalo Bills. Now, what did we that? always say before a few years ago? Better to be lucky than good. Yeah, that's Story what we always like to say here. Miami Dolphins. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know. Who's on third? Tua Tungavailoa still in the first three steps of concussion protocol per Barry Jackson at FLA Sports Buzz. Um, they, they're saying that to, Adam Schefter reports Miami wants to start Tua but is unsure he'll clear concussion protocol in time. Now, mm-hmm. if you remember correctly, John, Tua was having trouble remembering things after the Packers game the last yeah. time he suffered a concussion. Yeah. I can't imagine he's going to clear concussion protocol and then make a start on Sunday against the Buffalo Bills. Now, I understand the Miami Dolphins are in a bad spot. Last week, uh, Tua was out. Teddy mm-hmm. Bridgewater was out because Teddy Bridgewater has a, a fractured or a broken pinky. Either mm-hmm. way, bad shape where he can only throw short passes because mm-hmm. he can barely grip the ball appropriately. So they started, I think it was Skylar Thompson at Skylar quarterback. Skylar Thompson, yep. Which, that's a name. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know what they're going to do under center, man. Like they, they are in a lot of trouble, and it really seems like it's just catching up with them at this point. Well, I'll tell you what, kind of kind of along the city, you know, going back to Houston, we mentioned Houston earlier on. Uh, it was it almost reminds me of that year when uh, they signed Brock Osweiler to that big contract, and then by the time uh, by the time the playoffs rolled around, it, it wasn't Osweiler. It was like their third or fourth string Tyler something or whatever it was that was you know starting the playoff game against whomever they were playing and they got rolled completely. Um, I feel like this is kind of the same, the same situation there. Uh, who, if Tua were to start and were, I'm not saying this to be funny. I, I'm saying this because of ha- having concussions before knowing what that does to, to you, uh, and, you know, mentally. Um, I can't imagine having three, within a short span of time, like Tua has. Um, but I mean, like mental, the mental preparation, if, if Tua is mentally there and, and, and is okay and can clear and can play and, and be coherent enough, I think the Dolphins have a better shot, certainly, yeah. at, 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 you know, possibly beating the Bills. But 
if he's not under center, I, I don't care who's in it. They have to maybe get Marino out of retirement uh, to, to, may, to maybe you know, to compete against this Bills team because I just don't see it with Miami. It's funny you mention that because someone said, I don't think Marino in his prime could beat this Bills team. Uh, I think he could because the rules are different. Dan Marino, Dan Marino, yeah. a bitch. Now the, the rules are different now. Laces Marino, out, Dan. I think Marino would probably torch a lot of a lot of teams. Uh, if you take prime Dan Marino and put him in today's NFL, he'd probably torch a lot of them with all the a lot of teams with all of the uh, rules for the quarterbacks, especially. So I don't know. I don't know. But I don't know about that one. Maybe I stand Ryan by. Greasy I stand. Might not have been able to beat this Bills team, but Marino, I stand I'm, by I'm my. Sure. I stand by my statement. <laughs> I'm not the biggest Dolphins fan in the world, but I, I, I may have to, I may have to tell everybody to kind of, kind of calm, calm your tits a little bit about that, about that. Hey, so also with the quarterback up in, up in arms, or the, the who's going to start uh, questionable? I words are hard. I'm having trouble here. Injuries also mounting. Running back Raheem Mostert suffered a broken thumb against the Jets. Excuse me, in Week 18, per NFL's NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. Mm-hmm. His status is in doubt, but it doesn't sound like he's going to play, which would be a big loss for the Dolphins because Mostert feasted on the Buffalo Bills the last time that they played against each other a few weeks ago. Absolutely. Um, so, so real quick, eighty-one point eighty-six point one percent of America in ESPN's matchup predictor has the Buffalo Bills. Thirteen point eight percent have the Miami Dolphins, and point one percent have a tie. Which, hey. You dumbass. Ties can't happen in the playoffs. They'll play until there's a winner. It don't matter if it takes, I don't know, 12 days. I don't know. They play Maybe. to win the game. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. I like that. Good timing for that. John, who you got on Sunday? Buffalo Bills versus the Miami Dolphins. Well, 86.1% of America uh, has uh, Buffalo over Miami, like you said. Uh, really should be 96.1%. I, 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 Barring catastrophic circumstances, and I, I even hate to say that, it, it, it's an old tagline that I always say, you know, barring catastrophic circumstances, and then catastrophic circumstances kind of happened a week or so ago, so I can't really, I shouldn't yeah. really say something like that now, but uh, barring uh, extreme unforeseen, th- I don't know, Buffalo's going to win, and, and Buffalo should have no no problem in winning this game whatsoever. I've got Buffalo. Uh, by a a score of thirty five to thirteen, I I don't think it's going to be close. I I think the one thing for me is that the Buffalo Bills have been playing it safe lately. It feels like they've kind of calmed yes. down. They've kind of slowed down. But yes, and it, and it could be very strategic. We know playoff Josh Allen is real. Yes, yeah. Well, so not just playoff it, Josh Allen. <laughs> you know what playoff. sounds ridiculous. Playoff Highmark Stadium. Can I can I just real. can I just take back what I said mm. real quick? <sighs> the Buffalo Bills have been playing it safe lately, right? I just said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last three games that they played, they scored 32, 35, and 35 points. When in my life have I ever mentioned the statement? The Buffalo Bills have been playing it safe and averaged roughly 33, what, 33 and a half points? Right. Well, keep in mind, 14 of those points uh, last game came what a, from, kick, from from special teams. You what take a that world. out of the equation, you still have 21. <laughs> but what, a, what a world to live in where the Buffalo Bills are playing it safe, scoring over 30 points a game. That's crazy. But back to what I was saying here, I've been incredibly interested Mm -hmm. in seeing the Buffalo Bills just play, just playing to get to the playoffs. That's really what it feels like. I mean, don't forget, don't forget what happened last year in the postseason. Let me refresh your memory. Mm -hmm. In two games, Josh Allen threw for 637 yards, nine touchdowns, and no picks. Playoff Josh Allen is real. He averaged 7.9 yards per carry. Playoff Josh Allen is real, okay? I am ready for playoff Josh Allen to show up on Sunday 
with DeMar Hamlin being back in Buffalo, maybe we get some sort of video message to pump the crowd up or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I've heard nothing about that. I'm just, I'm just connecting dots here. Um, either way, I think the Bills Mafia are ready, more ready than ever for this playoff run because here's the thing. If all plays out the way that it should, this weekend we've got a great slate of games on Saturday at Seattle and San Fran. That'll be fantastic. The Chargers in Jacksonville, that might end up being the worst game of the weekend, and it still mm-hmm. might be good. We've got the the Giants and um the Giants and Vikings Sunday at 4 30. The Bills Dolphins at one o'clock on Sunday, the Ravens and Bengals at eight fifteen on Sunday, and then Monday we've got Dallas and Tampa Bay. A great slate of wild card games in the National Football League. If all plays out the way that we suspect it should, the Buffalo Bills uh, will likely be playing the Cincinnati Bengals next weekend at Highmark Stadium. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm just that- reading. I'm just reading the writing on the wall, and that's what that is. So that's why we've always talked about it being important to be the one seed. Obviously, it didn't work out because of uh, the the unfortunate situation with DeMar Hamlin uh, because essentially the one seed plays either Buffalo or Cincinnati. The two seed has to play Kansas City. uh, Well, the one seed plays yeah one of the two. The two seed has to play Cincinnati and Kansas City if they want to get to the Super Bowl. The one saving grace being that it could be it will be at a um at a uh, neutral site if it does happen. I mean, hopefully what happens is Kansas City loses, Buffalo wins and then they play the AFC title game in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Um that would be a nice fantasy, but back on track here, John. Well, you never know. It it, it could happen. And and honestly, I I genuinely in my heart feel that that is a very realistic possibility. I just, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not know. trying to be to... all happy and in, in, in whatnot, but mm-hmm. it really feels like the Buffalo bills year with all the tragedy. The team has faced with, with, uh, with Dawson Knox's brother passing away with DeMar Hamlin passing away and being brought back to life with everything that's happened in Buffalo. I mean, I'm not city to, in general. Yeah, I'm not trying to marginalize other cities like, you know, issues. But Buffalo has had, a, for, for lack of a better explanation, a really shitty year, a really uh, shitty. Yeah, absolutely. Months. Absolutely. What did I what did I tell what did I tell you in our BLTD group text when this all was going down? As where uh, well, we learned about uh, um, uh, Murph, by the way, John Murphy. Yes. Yeah, same um, thing that, with John Murphy, man. you know, with recently having, you know, finding out he had a he had a stroke the same week that. You know the 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 Hamlin is going to happen, and I and I said to you in the BLTD chat, like, dude, it's just at this point, it's like it's just not fair. <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? It, it exactly. just it doesn't feel like it's fair. Like nobody, no city. Not I'm not just talking about the team, but like no city deserves what the hell Buffalo has been through this last year. It's just been absurd. Well, you know what. I've got the Bills beating the Dolphins. I'm going to say 40 to 17. I'm going big. I want to see him drop it on him. I want to see it happen. You want to know what's funny is what, when we were talking about, you know, five minutes ago about um, the Buffalo Bills, you know, playing it safe and scoring 35 points, like how far we've come along. Yep. Just in this podcast series alone, as I like to, as I've liked to do periodically throughout the time, is go through uh, the the history of this podcast, particularly season number one, right? Of trust the podcast, and I and I and for some reason or another, this jumped out at me. It, it, it made me laugh and it, it made me smile um, because I'm reading the episode description of episode number ten, which was Buffalo Bills versus New Orleans Saints, and you talk about how far along. This franchise has come since this podcast's inception. Let me read to you episode 10's description. Oh, boy. Thus, the podcast is back on the air with another week of Bill's analysis. But this week, things are a little different. With the breaking news of Nathan Peterman getting his first NFL start over (laughs) Tyrod Taylor, surely there was more than enough to talk about. 
That doesn't even begin to mention the Bills' ugly 47-10 to 10 loss to the New Orleans Saints on Sunday. Tune Good in for the Lord. game talk. Stay for the takes. Craziest Good thing Lord. about this all, Buffalo still holds a playoff spot. <laughs> that was November 16th, 2017. A 46 minute long podcast for those interested in listening. Look at how far we've come. Come a very long way, my friend. Hey, we said it last year. And you know what? Even though I did send out a prediction, I'm going back to what we had last year the good vibes of last season. Just mm-hmm. win, baby. Or actually, sorry, sorry, sorry. To, to, to tune it up to Adam Cole. Just win. Baby. Oh boy, Adam Cole. I, I really hope he's you know custom yes. protocol and all that stuff too. I, I really hope he's okay. Absolutely. And he can come back to perform. Especially well, hey, with all the news that's happening in WWE right now. Holy crap. There's there's more news coming down. Uh, apparently coming hostile, down the too there. Nothing like a good old fashioned hostile takeover. But hey, much like Adam Cole, the Buffalo Bills, all about the boom, all about scoring them points, all about putting up them victories, my man. And as we've learned, what is what did Boomer always say? No one circles the wagons like the, like Buffalo, the Buffalo Bills. Bills. Hey, what an opportunity, you know, speaking of Boomer, what if it's finally the Boomer Bowl, Buffalo San Fran? Ooh. That would be an incredible matchup. Ooh. I'm all I'm all giddy about that one. The Bills <laughs> defense would eat Brock one. Purdy alive. They, um, they, yeah, they would. And that's a that's a fact. Okay. With that being said, John, I'm gonna go blow my nose and go to bed. You go to yeah. bed as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the day quill starting to kind of wear off a little, so I'm I'm, I'm starting to slow down. But John to is quill. <laughs> dude. If I take night quill, I'm gonna be messed up for days. I can't do that. Oh my goodness! Really? I'll start talking. I'll start talking out my ass in meetings, and people will be like, "Yo, what's wrong with Ryan? Is he on drugs?" No, I'm just on <laughs> date. I'm on Nyquil. All old right. Dennis Leary. Old Dennis Leary bit. There John is. is at John is at I am JC Money. Uh, I am at Wolf BLTD. John, as always, we are trust the podcast. You're not. We will catch you same time, same place next week. As always, go Bills. You know what? What the hell, Ryan? Go Bills. Go Bills. Love for DeMar. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.